Okay, hi everyone. I think we're ready to get started. Uh, Massimo, if you could go ahead and switch over to the main slide deck, uh, that would be great. Uh, so welcome everyone to our OpenSim webinar. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm the OpenSim R&D manager and the associate director of our National Center for Simulation in Rehab Research. And I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. I'm pleased to welcome today's presenter, Massimo Sartori, who's joining us from the University of Trenta, and he'll be presenting human-machine interfacing via real-time neuromechanical modeling. Next slide. Uh, so OpenSim is a freely available software application for visualizing musculoskeletal structures and simulating the movements of humans and animals. And the first goal of our webinar series is sh to showcase the cutting edge research that's being performed with the OpenSim software. OpenSim is also a large and uh, geographically diverse community of users. So the second goal of the webinar series is to provide a, a platform that the OpenSim community can use to communicate and collaborate. <coughs> Next slide. Before we get started, a few quick reminders about the format of the webinar. Uh, we definitely want to have time to answer your questions, uh, but we'll do that at the end of the webinar. Uh, and the questions will be text-based through the WebEx Q&A panel. If you need any additional technical help, uh, you can consult the guide on our website or send us a chat to the panelists via the Q&A interface. Uh, next slide. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, so Massimo Sartori is an assistant professor at the University of Twente, where he directs the Neuromechanical Modeling and Engineering Lab. His research focuses on interfacing robotic technologies with the neuromuscular system for enhancing human movement. Uh, Massimo is a very active member of the OpenSim community. Uh, he was a participant in our NCSRR Visiting Scholars Program. He's an OpenSim Fellow, uh, and he's also helped to run several workshops and tutorials for the OpenSim community. Uh, so we're really excited to have him present at the webinar today. Uh, really looking forward to the talk. And with that, I will let you take it away, Massimo. All right. Thank you, Jen, for the introductions. And, and hi, everyone. It's uh, pleasure to give this webinar today. I hope that you can hear my voice clearly. Um, so with this presentation, I would like to give an overview on how we can record information from the human nervous system and use this information in combination with uh, biomechanical modeling to decode the mechanics of the musculoskeletal system. And I would like to show how doing this is central for interfacing the human body with wearable assistive technologies that can enhance our ability of, of moving. So the, the emphasis of my talk will be on human movement and on how movement is altered by impairment, but also on how wearable robotic technologies can be created to best restore natural motor function following impairment. And we are still somehow limited in treating physical impairment, essentially because we have a limited understanding of how um, wearable technologies interact with our body. And to understand uh, uh, this better, first we need to understand the very foundations of, of human movement. We need to understand how the central nervous system interacts with the body for the generations of a movement and we need to understand how wearable robots can take part in this neuromechanical interplay. So to address this, this, this research goal, I propose a specific paradigm that is based on three major steps. So first, we need to establish a clinically viable interface with the central nervous system an interface that we can use to record the activity of neural cells that are involved in the generations of emotion. Uh, in this context, alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord are good candidates. Then we need to build mechanistic models of the human body that we can use to um, estimate how the human body operates as controlled by the nervous system. If we can do these two steps accurately, and if we can do them in real time, 
Then we have the basis for establishing an interface between humans and wearable robots. And in this webinar, I will focus on two scenarios. I will introduce uh, control of um, bionic limbs for upper extremities and control of robotic exoskeletons for lower extremities. Um, in this webinar, I will show how to do this using uh, two major software tools. The first is OpenSIM. Um, OpenSIM is an open source toolbox and uh, which enables building musculoskeletal models and simulating them using forward and inverse dynamics formulations. In this specific webinar, I will mostly make use of OpenSIM inverse dynamics. For those of you who are not entirely familiar with inverse dynamics, very briefly, uh, in inverse dynamics, the idea is to start with measurements um, of the movement that we want to uh, uh, simulate. For instance, we can measure um, human body kinematics using reflective markers, and we can record the 3D positions of each marker using a set of cameras. And we can also use force plates to record the interaction forces exchanged between the foot and the ground. And the idea is to use uh, these measurements uh, and to fit these measurements into uh, equations of motions that describe uh, the human body that we want to simulate. In this way, we can convert marker trajectories into estimates of, of joint angles. Uh, and we could do this using inverse kinematics, which is a, a, a feature in OpenSIM. Uh, but we could also um, convert joint angles into joint moments. And joint moments are the net uh, forces that contribute to accelerate um, articular joints. And we can do this using OpenSIM's inverse dynamics uh, feature. And then we, we can actually go further down this pipeline and, and decompose net joint moments into the constitu constituent um, forces produced by the individual muscle tendon units that span a specific joint. <clears throat> uh, the second software tool uh, that I will use is called Cinemas. Uh, CINEMAS stands for Calibrated EMG Informed Neuromusculoskeletal Modeling Toolbox. It is an open source toolbox which is available on simtk.org, just, uh, just like OpenSIM. Um, and very briefly in this webinar, I will use CINEMAS to perform forward dynamic simulations. So the idea is to start from measurements of muscle excitations uh, typically derived from EMG signals, uh, but also we need measurements of muscle tendon kinematics, and we, we get this information from directly from OpenSIM. And CINEMAS uses these two types of input to uh, simulate all the transformations that take place from the onset of muscle excitation to the productions of mechanical force in muscles and, and joints. <clears throat> well, CINEMAS has been developed um, over the past 15 years by a number of people. Um, and with this slide, I would like to acknowledge all of them. All right, so we can now go back to the general outline of this webinar. Um, and I'd like to go through each of these three major steps and briefly outline how we are implementing them right now. Um, so starting with the first point, we know that um, a clinically viable way to interface with the nervous system uh, can be done using electromyography. Uh, during the generations of a movement, uh, synaptic inputs are produced in different areas of the nervous system. And these inputs ultimately converge into the spinal cord, specifically into pools of alpha motor neurons. So alpha motor neurons are neural cells located in the spinal cord. And these neurons, they essentially branch out of the spine and innervates into muscle fibers in the periphery. So because of this strong synaptic connection between neurons and muscles, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between electrical potentials producing the neuron and electrical potentials producing the muscles. So all the time a motor neuron fire, there's a resulting action potential in the muscle fiber that makes the muscle twitching. So 
This means that the biological information that we record from the muscle, the EMG signals, theoretically contains information about the time events at which, during which multiple motor neurons fires. Um, and it is actually possible to extract such information from the EMG using advanced um, electrodes and signal processing techniques. And I would like to give a, a brief introduction to that. So the idea is to use uh, electronic schemes, which are uh, grids of, of highly densely located electrodes that you can place on top of a specific muscle. So in this way, you can record the electrical activity produced by hundreds of muscle fibers simultaneously. Um, the idea then is to use, is to actually apply blind source separation to decompose this interferent EMG signal into the contributions of the alpha motor neurons that are active in the control of that specific muscle. So this is a powerful technique because it enables you to record non-invasively from the periphery of the system, but open a window into uh, neural activity um, in the spinal cord. So this enables you to establish a neural interface. Um, I'd like to spend a few words on how this blind source separation technique works. Uh, the idea is to frame it as the cocktail party problem. Uh, you know, we have, a uh, we have a number of people speaking simultaneously in a room, and we have a number of microphones, and every microphone picks up a superposition of people's voices. Um, the idea is to use the information recorded from multiple microphones to separate uh, the voice, the soundtrack of each individual person. So you can see that the analogy with our application is very strong. In our case, each person represents the source of the information. So in this case, alpha motor neurons. And the microphones reflect the electrode that we use to sense such information. Um, so the, the idea of separating uh, interferent information into individual sources is based on the ability of building mathematical models that describe how the EMG signal is, genera is generated. So we want to build mathematical models that describe how the interferent EMG signals is produced by the firings of motor neurons. And the idea is to invert this model. To do this, we have to make a few assumptions. The first assumption is that the number of uh, um, sensors that we use is greater than, than the number of sources that we want to, to decompose. So we want to have more electrodes than motor units. This assumption is important because we can then model the system as an overdetermined system that we can invert using least square methods. We can then apply additional assumptions. For example, we know that um, alpha motor neurons fire with relatively low frequencies. So the distributions of firings will be non-Gaussians and will be sparse in nature. Um, uh, and this uh, in, gives you additional ability of, uh, of, uh, of uh, kind of solving the least square optimization. So I will not go into the details of this technique, but if you want to know more, you can check out these two recent publications at the bottom. And you can also take a look at this website that provides insight on how blind source separation can be applied, not only in the context of EMG, but also in other applications. The important point, though, is that EMG signals contain information about the discharges of alpha motor neurons, and therefore muscles are good candidates for establishing a clinically viable interface with the nervous system. Um, our first tests in this direction involved recording high density electromyography uh, from, from the calf muscles uh, from a number of healthy subjects performing isometric plantar dorsiflexions. That's what the high density EMG looks like for one muscle for the tibialis anterior. So you can see that for every muscle, we have 64 readings of um, EMG activity. Um, and the idea essentially is to apply the blind source separation technique that I outlined previously 
and to extract information about motor neuron discharges. So what you get out of this essentially is binary information. So in this, in this diagram, every row represents the spike train of a specific alpha motor neuron. So the spike train contains binary information. So every, within, within, within a spike train, every vertical line tells you whether that neuron is firing at that specific instant of time. So you can actually do this for all the muscles spanning the ankle. In this way, you can extract spike trains for populations of hundreds of alpha motor neurons. So you can really open a window into spinal mechanisms. And then if you want, you can combine this information with uh, anatomical uh, uh, properties of the spine and you can map uh, individual alpha motor neuron spike trains into lumbar and sacral uh, segmental levels in the spine. And this gives the possibility to, to visualize how different spine segments engage in the control of the ankle joint. In the second part of the webinar, I will show you how we can link these discrete spike trains with OpenSIM models for linking uh, what happens at the spinal cord with uh, the resulting function at the musculoskeletal level. All right, so once we can, once we interface with the nervous system, the next step is to develop mechanistic models of the human body that we can use to simulate how the musculoskeletal system operates as controlled by the nervous system. Um, the simplest possible way of doing this is to use conventional bipolar EMG signals to drive large scale models of the human body. So the idea is to record EMG linear envelopes for multiple muscles and to use these envelopes to drive uh, individual muscle tendon units within an open sim model. This approach is called EMG driven modeling. So in this way, you can uh, reconstruct and simulate all the transformations that go from the onset of muscle activation to the generations of mechanical force in muscle tendon units and joints. Um, these models are initially calibrated, and calibration is needed to identify the value of a number of parameters that uh, determine how the muscle activate and contract. So calibration in this case is framed as an optimization problem. So we essentially tune these internal parameters until the model has learned to convert input EMG signals into output torque. At the end of the calibration, these models can operate um, in open loop. So there's no need for reference torque values anymore. These models can translate EMG linear envelopes and joint angles into estimate of joint torques. Um, over the past, we validated these methods uh, on the ability of predicting a variety of internal body forces, including joint torques, but also forces that are more dependent on uh, muscle coactivation, such as joint compress compress uh, compressive loads and joint stiffness. Um, the estimation of, of joint torques and the calibrations of the model is currently supported uh, by CINEMAS. Um, right now, we are working on extending uh, these methodologies for predicting joint stiffness. Uh, as I said before, joint stiffness is tightly dependent on muscle coactivation, but it also depends on, uh, uh, on the kinematics of muscle fibers and, and tendons. Um, these are some very preliminary results in this direction. So uh, we asked subjects to perform dynamic plantar dorsiflexions using our robotic dynamometers. Um, and during this exercise, we used this robotic dynamometer to apply micro perturbations to the ankle joint. Uh, in this way, we could measure the elastic response of the, uh, of the ankle joint to the perturbations. And using system identification techniques, specifically a method that was published by Ludwig and Perot in 2012, we could derive reference values um, of joint stiffness throughout the plantar dorsiflexion uh, gait cycle. 
But we can derive joint stiffness also using a modeling approach, uh, the same modeling approach that I outlined before. And these are our first preliminaries in this direction. So this shows um, this, this red curve represents the upper and lower standard deviations for the joint stiffness estimate and using the model. And you can see that there is a level of agreement between the model-based estimate of stiffness and the reference estimates of stiffness. So these are um, results that are promising, but nevertheless, we need more work to really make this approach generalizable. All right, so far I, I, I gave a few examples on how we can use EMG linear envelopes to drive musculoskeletal models. However, EMG linear envelopes represent a surrogate of, of, of the neural activity generated by alpha motor neurons. So the idea is to make one step forward and really drive these models using uh, 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 the spike trains uh, uh, produced by alpha motor neurons. And I will show how we're doing this for the estimations of joint torque. So I, I'd like to go back to, to, to one of the slides that I presented previously. So the idea is to extract spike trains from multiple muscles and multiple motor neurons and use these informations to drive forward open sim models. If we can do this, then we have the possibility of understanding how ankle torque is controlled by multiple neurons simultaneously. Um, this is an example of the experimental setup. So here you can see how these electronic schemes were placed on five muscles spanning the ankle joint. And this is the dynamometer preparation that we used to record reference torque at the ankle. Um, this diagram, again, shows an example of individual spike trains decomposed from 50 alpha motor neurons over a contraction that lasts about nine seconds. In this specific study, we actually combined individual spike trains together to compute the so-called cumulative spike train. So this was done by summing up individual spike trains together. So the cumulative spike trains essentially represent the net firings of all the alpha motor neurons involved in the control of a specific muscle. So this, this spike trains provides a high fidelity estimates of the neural drive sent from the central nervous system to the muscle in the periphery. So the idea is to extract cumulative spike trains from multiple uh, plantar flexor muscles, in this case, five plantar flexor muscles, and two dorsiflexor muscles. Uh, and then we can use the spike trains to simulate how multiple motor neurons regulate uh, the length of muscle fibers. We can simulate changes in penetration angle. We can understand how serious elastic tendons stretch in response to muscle contraction. But most importantly, we can understand using this framework how neural information is, is converted by the muscle in mechanical force. This is the force produced by the muscle tendon unit. So using this framework, we can translate the language of the nervous system, which essentially is frequency information, into the language of the musculoskeletal system, which is mechanical force. Uh, we can then use geometrical information about how muscles wrap around joints to convert uh, muscle tendon specific force into muscle tendon specific moments. And then we can add muscle tendon moments together to compute the net torque at the ankle joint. And you can see that the torque estimates derived from spike trains match pretty well uh, the reference torque measured using the, the dynamometer. We now have a framework that we can use to understand cause-effect relationships between neural and mechanical uh, mechanisms. So for example, we can, uh, you can see very briefly that uh, in the first 50% uh, of, the, of this plantar dorsiflexion task, so this is the dorsiflexion part of the, of the task, you can see that the shape of the of the ankle torque really mimics the shape of the low frequency components extracted from the cumulative spike trains of all the motor neurons controlling the tibialis anterior muscle. So joint torque is encoded in the spinal cord in the low frequency components 
um, of alpha motor neurons. So this is important to understand how we move, and it, and it is important to understand what goes wrong after a neuromuscular impairment. Um, we can now start and use this technique to understand the neuromechanics of, of more complex movements, such as locomotion. So far, I only showed isometric plantar dorsiflexion, and the idea is the same. So we can decode spike trains uh, as, as an individual moves and use this spike train to drive large-scale models of the musculoskeletal system. In this way, we can really understand how spinal secretaries control our body. And the significance of this is that we can now give a mechanical meaning to neural activity that would be otherwise too complex to understand in, uh, in, in complex movements such as locomotion. So the ability of combining signal processing and modeling provides new opportunities for understanding the underlying neuromechanics. Um, all right, and this brings me to the third part of this presentation. If we can simulate and understand the neuromechanics of individual subjects, we can also use this approach to establish new uh, ways of interfacing the human with wearable robots. Um, the very first step to, to, to use signal processing and modeling to establish meme-machine interfaces is to perform all the steps that I showed so far in real time. And for doing this, uh, my colleagues and I developed um, additional uh, repositories on top of, of Cinemas and on top of OpenSim that can help uh, running OpenSim and Cinemas in real time. So I will show three basic repositories. The first, um, the first toolbox enables creating surrogates of OpenSim models using uh, a set of spline functions. So this is very nice if you want to run large OpenSIM models in real time uh, uh, with, 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 with very good time efficiency. The second is an OpenSIM model um, of the upper limb that I derived from the work of Wendy Murray and, and colleagues at Northwestern University. And I use this model for applications in uh, prosthetic control, and I will show this later. Um, and the third is a real-time toolbox that enables running certain functionalities of OpenSIM in real time. Um, so the idea is to use the OpenSIM APIs together with, with the, with the real-time toolbox that I presented to perform inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics in real time. So if you can do this, you can really convert motion capture data into uh, and you can actually you, you can essentially animate OpenSIM models and estimate joint angles and joint torques online on the fly. Uh, so this gives real-time estimates of joint angles that can be used as an input to the OpenSIM's API and the spline toolbox to compute in real time the kinematics of muscle tendon units. So you can estimate in real time muscle tendon length. But you can also estimate in real time the moment arms that every muscle tendon unit has with respect to a specific degrees of freedom. Um, in combination with EMG signals, you now have all the information that you need to operate cinemas in real time and estimate EMG dependent estimates of muscle force and joint torques. So more specifically, uh, the interface between OpenSIM, cinemas, and the external world is done using uh, a number of TCP IP sockets. So TCP IP sockets are typically used to collect information from external devices, uh, such as an EMG amplifier or a motion capture system. So TCP IP sockets are a programming module that enables you to exchange information using the local uh, network. <clears throat> uh, the idea then is to uh, effectively use OpenSIM outputs as an input to the spline toolbox. And again, now you have all the inputs that you need to run OpenSIM. You have muscle activations in real time through the TCP IP socket connected to the EMG amplifier. And you have muscle tendon kinematics, so moment arms and muscle tendon length, uh, from the spline toolbox connected to OpenSIM in real time. And OpenSIM is connected in real time to a motion capture system. 
So you can now use cinemas to predict joint moments and muscle forces, and you can visualize this information using a graphical user interface. Uh, and if you can run this pipeline in real time, you can essentially do what you see in this video. So as the subject moves, you can perform inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics uh, to compute joint angles and, uh, and uh, joint torques. You can then measure EMGs from, uh, from the right leg, and you can estimate in real time EMG dependent estimates of muscle forces. In this case, for 13 muscles spanning uh, the knee and the, uh, and the ankle joint. And then muscle forces are used, to, are used to compute knee and ankle torque. And you can see how the model-based estimate of torque, the blue line, uh, matches pretty well the red curve, which, is, which represent joint moments derived using uh, inverse dynamics uh, in OpenSIM, which is based on, on force plates. So this provides confidence that these real-time models, once they are calibrated, they can effectively capture uh, the mechanics of the musculoskeletal system pretty well. So you can use this approach now to interface the human body with a variety of robotic devices. The first example that I will give is uh, uh, control of uh, upper limb prosthesis uh, for upper limb amputations. And the idea is pretty simple. The idea is to record information about alpha motor neurons activity, to use this information to, in combination with modeling to predict how the amputee's phantom limb operates in space, and then to prescribe the predicted uh, behavior of the phantom limb to the prosthesis. If we can do this, then we can really enable amputees to control their prosthesis as a natural extension of their own body. Uh, I will show some results from uh, a specific type of amputees. These are um, patients who underwent a special surgical procedure, which is called targeted muscle re -innervation. The idea is that the residual nerves that used to control distal degrees of freedom, such as the, the hand and the wrist and the elbow, they are rerouted to residual muscle tissues surrounding the chest. So in this way, all the time, the subject thinks of controlling a specific degrees of freedom in the frontal limb, for example, the wrist pronation. The underlying nerve activity is sent to a muscle and the muscle essentially amplifies this nerve information in the form of an EMG signal. So using these electronic skins, we can now pick up EMG activity that reflects nerve information. So this is really precious information that we can use to decode the neuromechanics of the frontal limb. And the idea is to combine this information with uh, subject-specific models of the, um, of the amputees. <clears throat> this is the actual uh, subject that, that, we, that we worked with. So this is a transhumeral amputee. And here you can see these electronic skins placed on the stump. Um, because this is a TMR subject, we could map the areas in the stump that are associated to the control of a specific degrees of freedom. So we could map where the areas connected to elbow flexion was, we could map where elbow extension was, we could map wrist pronation, wrist supination, as well as radial ulnar deviation, as well as hand opening and closing. Um, we then built uh, a subject specific model using OpenSIM, uh, which included the intact limb, the residual limb, and the phantom limb. We then collected high density EMG from the stump and we decomposed it to recover the spike trains produced by uh, the alpha motor neurons that were active in the control of the phantom limb. And we then used these uh, discrete spike trains to drive forward uh, 12 uh, virtual muscles that are important for, for, for the actuations of the elbow and the wrist. So these are the, uh, the time profiles of, uh, of the muscle force produced by 12 uh, muscles spanning the elbow and the wrist. Uh, and we then, just like I showed you before, we then use geometrical information to project muscle force into the phantom elbow and into the phantom wrist. So in this way, we could estimate the torques actuating the phantom limb 
about the elbow flexion extension degrees of freedom, forearm rotation, and the wrist flexion extension as controlled by alpha motor neurons. And we, we did that during mirror movement. So we asked the, 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 the patient to, to, to follow the, the phantom limb movement using the intact limb. And we recorded intact limb torque using inverse dynamics. And here you can see that the, the torques decoded from the phantom limb, the gray curve, reflects pretty well the torque measured from the intact limb in the three degrees of freedoms. So this gives us confidence that this approach can capture the neuromechanics of phantom limbs. So if we can predict the mechanical forces that contribute to actuate the phantom limb, can we use this information to control a robotic prosthesis in real time? Uh, we've investigated this question on a transradial amputees. So this is an amputee who did not underwent this TMR surgery. And also on this amputee, we are not using high density EMG. We are using conventional bipolar EMGs to record the activity of eight muscles. But nevertheless, the idea is the same. Record EMG information and use this to predict the mechanics of the phantom wrist and the phantom hand. So if you can do this in real time, then you can provide amputees with a completely new approach to control multiple degrees of freedoms in a robotic prosthesis. So here you can see how the amputees can control the rotations of the wrist as well as the opening and closing of the hands uh, during complex tasks. Um, because this is a fully biomimetic approach, there's virtually no learning involved from the amputee side. The amputee only has to think about moving his own phantom limb and the prosthesis will capture these movements in real time. So there's virtually no training required for the amputee. Um, so in this way, you can really uh, enable the uh, simultaneous control of two degrees of freedom. So this graphical user interface was used to test whether the amputee could uh, simultaneously actuate the rotation and flexion extensions of the wrist. And you can see in the background the biomechanical model that predicts the behavior of the phantom limb, which is transferred to the prosthesis. So in this way, you can really enable uh, these individuals to perform uh, functionally relevant tasks in, in an extremely robust way. So the amputee can grasp heavy objects, can shake them, and can place them back. Uh, and the prosthesis always behaves uh, as wanted. So this, these are exciting results from our side. But in this way, we can control virtually any device that is connected to the human body. So we can also enable control of robotic exoskeletons. And the idea is pretty similar. The idea is to use these models to predict the residual strengths uh, in, in an individual's joint. So we can predict how strong or how weak a patient is, and then ask the exoskeleton to make up for whatever force is missing uh, that is required for achieving a specific motor task. So here we can see how we can do this in real time. As the subject moves, we can simulate uh, the neuromechanics uh, of the subject. And this gives us the possibility to understand how the exoskeleton alters uh, the biomechanics of the, of the subject. And then we can close the loop at the level of the exoskeleton. Um, and we're now applying this approach to a variety of neurologically impaired patients. This is an incomplete spinal cord injury patient. And using this modeling approach, we are predicting the residual torque in the ankle and using this to control the exoskeleton. You can see that despite the residual motion in the ankle is very limited, this uh, patient can steer the ankle joint of this exoskeleton. And when the subject wears the exoskeleton, he can actually achieve a larger range of motion in the ankle. But most importantly, he can also control the knee, which was a degree of freedom that was highly paretic and that he could barely move without the exoskeleton. These are similar results derived from, from a stroke patient. Uh, and you can see that the stroke patient can achieve proportional uh, and simultaneous control of two degrees of freedom simultaneously using his paretic leg. Um, all right, so this is one of the last slides of my presentations, and I would like to, to summarize what has been said so far. 
I showed how we can link uh, between the neural and the mechanical levels of understanding of movement uh, using a combination of high density electromyography and musculoskeletal modeling. I call this approach neuromechanical modeling. And I showed how we can translate this technique to clinical scenarios involving uh, uh, transhumeral and transradial amputees, as well as neurologically impaired patients. And I believe that this approach will, will open new possibilities for correcting disruptive functions in, in individuals with neuromuscular and orthopedic uh, injuries. With this slide, I'd like to give a special thank to, to all the people that helped make this work possible. And I also would like to thank my current uh, funding uh, body. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I would like to end my webinar. All right, thanks Massimo for the really interesting talk. Um, super clear and really exciting results. Uh, now we'd like to go ahead and uh, start the Q&A session. So as I said at the beginning, all the questions will be text-based. So go ahead and find the Q&A box on your WebEx screen. Uh, on mine, it's in the bottom right-hand part of the screen. Type in your question and make sure you choose to uh, ask all panelists. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and take questions. Um, okay, so we'll wait for questions to come in. I'll go ahead and ask one. Um, one thing I was curious about Massimo is how much um, variability there is between subjects as far as how easy it is to use the device, how accurate they are in controlling the device. Yeah, yeah, it is. Thanks for thanks for this question, Jan. Um, <clears throat> there is indeed variability um, in the neurologically impaired patients that we worked with. Uh, we worked with two stroke patients and with uh, one spinal cord injury patient. And for these three patients, the 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 ability of calibrating the model was was crucial. Uh, and that's because the force generating capacity of these patients' muscles uh, largely varied across across patients. Uh, and also every, su every subject has different uh, inherent ability of steering the exoskeleton. So um, we're hoping that uh, the calibration pipeline that we set up uh, could be translated to a larger set of patients in the future. So we are, we are actually planning more tests on a larger number of patients. Um, but because this is a model-based approach, um, it could be that in the future, maybe uh, the ability of using imaging techniques, something like portable ultrasound, for example, will provide even more possibilities for personalizing the underlying models to the individual subjects. In the context of amputees so far, we only had tests on um, so real-time tests on uh, on one uh, patient only. So we cannot say much on how the real-time uh, method can can be translated to different patients. However, we use the approach offline on um, on a variety of patients, and we could we could achieve comparable uh, performances in the estimations of uh, frontal limb torques. Okay, thanks, Massimo. Another uh, somewhat related question is how much, um, uh, so I think you do the CMS parameter tuning to an individual subject. Is how, um, how subject specific and does the, do the models need to be for the control to be successful? Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's, that's another, good, another good question. Um, so, well, we found that the most important parameters to be to be identified for enabling robust real-time control uh, really are the parameters within the heel type muscle model within within the within the muscle model itself. So this includes tendon slack length and um, an optimal fiber length and and maximal isometric force. Um, so those parameters are very important because the underlying model is very sensitive to those parameters. So um, 
at the moment we ask the subject to perform um, in the exoskeleton case, we ask the subject to perform isometric uh, tasks, so isometric planted or planted or reflections for the exoskeleton, and and then we simply train the model using uh, the force sensors uh, embedded in the exoskeleton. So that that's basically the reference torque value that we use to to calibrate the model. Uh, and so far, this method has worked. Uh, well, uh, on, on the three patients that we that we worked with, um, in the amputee uh, uh, scenario, we asked the um, the amputee to uh, we 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 use two different ways of calibration. First, we asked the, the amputee to perform mirror tasks, and we calibrated the model using um, the Torx um, uh, measure from the from the intact side. Um, and also in this case, we found that uh, the muscle model parameters were were the most important to be to be identified. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so now we have some questions coming in from the audience. The first is from Simon Song, um, and he asks: Is it correct to think the cumulative um, spike trains? Think of the cumulative spike trains as a filtered EMG. In other words, is EMG equal to alpha motor spikes plus noise, or are there more information in EMG than those spikes? Yeah, it's it's a really good it's a really good question. Um, well, there is there is a structural difference between um, the information contained in the cumulative spike train and the information contained in the raw high density EMG. Um, the, the the problem with the raw high density EMG is that uh, in the end you want to extract an information that is proportional to to the activations of the muscle. So what you what you do is you low pass filter the raw EMG and then you create a signal whose amplitude is proportional to the activation. The problem is that the amplitude itself in the raw EMG signal does not purely reflect muscle activation. And the reason is that um, is that the, uh, the, the, the electrical signal that you pick up from the muscles is, um, is affected by the shape of the action potentials produced by the muscles. So if you are recording the muscle particularly close closely to a specific motor neuron, you may be picking up a large action potential, which will produce a large amplitude in the muscle. So in this case, the large amplitude that you see does not reflect the fact that your motor neurons are being recruited with higher frequencies, but simply reflect the fact that your electrode is closer to a specific uh, muscle fiber. So in long story short, you cannot fully assume that the amplitude information from linearly filtered EMG reflects one-to-one uh, -one the activation of the muscle. Whereas, if you are able to decompose the EMG signal into into spike trains, then you can extract an activation profile that is purely function of the frequency of the firing frequency of alpha motor neurons. So you are now you now have a signal that is much more related to the real effective muscle activation generated by the nervous system. I hope I don't know if this is clear. Yeah, thank you. That that makes sense. Um, now we have a question from Vishal Ranveen Jonathan. Um, it's a great presentation. Thank you. I'm interested to know how the quality in terms of accuracy of bipolar EMG and high density EMG affects the torque outputs. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 also <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, so. Um, we had some we, we did some tests in this in this direction and and we found that um, high density EMG in combination with the composition has when combined with models provides benefit in a variety of scenarios. Uh, a more applicative scenario is that of amputees. Um, if you want to estimate joint torques about many degrees of freedoms. For example, three degrees of freedom in the wrist. Uh, 
using the global EMG, you may be dealing with a lot of crosstalk. That's because the muscles controlling the wrist are very closely uh, located with one another. Uh, and there's a lot of crosstalk that you can actually uh, uh, extract if you work with a global EMG. We noticed that uh, using the composition, you can extract uh, spike trains that are more separated across degrees of freedoms. So you, you, you can use this decomposition approach to, to kind of throw away information that, uh, uh, that, is, that is close to noise, or that is close to movement artifacts, information that would kind of bias your predictions of torques across multiple degrees of freedom. So that's one benefit that we found. Another benefit is that uh, using spike trains, you can uh, estimate torques during fine, fine control type of movements. So you can estimate torques, uh, torques variation that are that are very small. And you couldn't do this with the linear filter EMG because um, because the signal that you are that you, that you would be looking to extract would be too close to the to, to the noise level of the EMG. So if you want to be able to predict very subtle changes in torque, which is important for fine control, such as such as what 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 the hand does, um, then the EMG, uh, the global EMG may be too noisy and uh, it may be beneficial to decompose it into spike trains. And this can provide you access to activity in uh, during very low effort uh, tasks. Okay, Th thanks Massimo. Um, yeah. Now another question from Adam Charles. He says, inspiring work. Um, you're using an open loop model that takes into account efferent feedback signals, but not afferent or the temporary closed loop feedback of the neuromuscular system. System, Can you comment on this limitation with human prosthetic interactions? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a, it's a great question. Um, uh, yeah, so so um, it, it's so the, the the open loop model that I showed it is it, it's true it is it is open loop and it effect, effectively simulates all the transformations from from uh, from from input neural drive to a muscle into torque. So we're not really modeling afferent fibers. Uh, such as Golgi tendon organs or muscle spindles. It is true. Uh, but because our method is, uh, is data-driven, so we kind of fuse EMG data with models, um, and because we extract information of alpha motor neurons, we are inherently using uh, efferent and afferent information simultaneously. And that's because alpha motor neurons are the final common pathway of all synaptic inputs. So all the efferent input and all the afferent inputs produced by Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles, eventually they all fall into alpha motor neuron pools. So the cumulative spike train that you extract is the integrated versions of, of uh, efferent and afferent inputs. So this, and that is why you can use this signal uh, in a variety of applications uh, um, involving uh, uh, upper limb, lower limb, and also control. But however, I think that, um, and that's something that, that, that we're working on in the future, we, we definitely want to expand our pipeline to also um, include models of, of afferent, um, afferent fibers. Uh, Definitely. Cool. Thanks. There's a, a, I'm going to keep moving because there's a few more questions that have come in. Lots of great questions. Um, next is one from Harold Panasso. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Do you, you think it would be possible to use high density EMG de decomposition together with synergies of walking in order to predict and control powered prosthesis torques from muscles above the amputation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's 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 a great question, um, and and indeed in the, the answer is yes, and and this relates to one of the of the answer that I gave previously, because the raw EMG 
is biased by the shape of the action potentials. When you extract synergies from raw EMGs, you may be extracting also a biased estimate of muscle synergies. Um, so the ability of, 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 of using high density electromyography gives you the possibility to, to remove uh, biased components from your signal. Um, and that could give you better ways to, to extract muscle synergies that are better reflective of spinal secretories. And I, and I believe that this could have direct impact for, for the real-time control of, of, uh, of lower limb prosthesis, definitely. Okay, thanks, Massimo. Now a question from Michael Rosenberg. Um, can you discuss the challenges or feasibility of getting some of these methods to smaller clinical centers that may not have as rich a set of experimental resources? For example, yeah. how robust is the framework to missing sensors? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, so, um, the field of electromyography is is really changing really rapidly. Um, um, so far, electromyography has been dominated by conventional bipolar recordings and also by hardware that supports um, bipolar recordings. But now companies are are um, rapidly moving towards high density technologies and portable high density technologies and wireless high density technologies. So this and there are there are, there are already some some products out there that can be that can be purchased uh, right now. Uh, and this happened only very recently, but this is what was really needed to 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 translate some of these techniques to the clinics. You you now have the possibility to to have completely portable high density EMG systems. Uh, so I guess this addresses one one of the points. Uh, the second part of the question was on data loss and how, and on how data loss can impact results. Again, I think that if you if you use high density EMG, then you you can really exploit redundancy. So you you now have many electrodes that are picking up information from the body. So even if some of these electrodes are not properly working, um, hopefully the other ones will still be picking up information that is that is relevant for the type of movement that 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 you're doing so i i tend to believe that having many electrodes can provide robustness because you can you can afford to lose certain channels without compromising your recordings that's not the case when you have one channel per muscle if you lose that one channel you also lose that one muscle Okay, so we'll take one last question uh, before we wrap up. This is from JC. Um, the question is about part three. Uh, is there any standard for choosing the reinnervated muscle since the patients um, may have different level of amputation? Uh, not that I am aware of. Um, um, no, I. I don't think so. I don't think that this procedure has been standardized so far. Um, what we did was really to ask, well, to cover the stump. I guess with possibly another way yes. that, to ask the question, does, do you think the approach would work for different levels of amputation or are there some set of um, muscles that you need to be able to record? Oh, all right. All right. Okay. I, I think, I think I understand now. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Yes, I think I think that uh, it, it, it it kind of depends on how the surgery is performed. Normally, in in trans in trans in transhumeral amputees uh, and in and in uh, shoulder level amputees, you wanna have at least five reinnervations areas so that you could essentially steer up to five degrees of freedoms. Um, the surgical procedure itself is quite standardized, and and I think that it is possible to achieve four to five innervation areas uh, per stump. Um, the, and this makes essentially the approach quite applicable to different scenarios. Okay, thank, thanks, Massimo. Um, it's just about 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and wrap up here. There were a couple questions that we didn't get to, um, but we'll send those to you, Massimo, and uh, <coughs> could maybe answer those in the follow-up email. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you could, Massimo, advance, advance through the last couple slides. So thank you everyone for the really great questions and discussion. 
um, OpenSim and this webinar series are supported by several grants that I want to acknowledge from the NIH, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Next slide. Thank you again for the great discussion. You can find more information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources for the OpenSim community um, at our website. Uh, please also complete the survey that will appear in a pop-up window in the conclusion of the webinar. Um, we'll also send out a follow-up email that has web links, um, the Q&A, um, links to the software that Massimo mentioned in papers, so you can look out for that in your email. Um, and uh, I think, is that the last slide, Massimo? Uh, yeah, that's the last slide, yeah. Thank you, Massimo, again, for a really great and stimulating presentation. Thank you to My everyone pleasure. for the great questions. Um, thank you for participating in the webinar, and we hope you'll all continue to stay involved with OpenSim. Thanks, everyone.